in its image and behavior, the gibbon embodies that compelling fascination the ape has held for every age of man. The idea that the ape was a relative of man was ridiculed in Victorian England. The theory of evolution, published in 1859 by Charles Darwin, unleashed a controversy that raged around the world. More than a half a century later, it reached its unlikely climax in Dayton, Tennessee. John Scopes was put on trial for teaching evolution in a public school. In the summer of 1925, Dayton was a carnival of ideologies. The state versus Scopes became the fundamentalists versus evolution. Scopes' trial became a personal duel between two old antagonists, Clarence Darrow, a free thinker, and William Jennings Bryan, three times presidential candidate and biblical scholar. Though Scopes was found guilty, Bryan's arguments were shattered by Darrow and the 20th century. The Scopes Monkey Trial was the last great public debate over Darwin's theories. With the appearance of a grasping hand some 60 million years ago, the climb began up the evolutionary ladder that ultimately would lead to man himself. They are prosimians, pre-monkeys, descendants of prehistoric insect eaters, the first to lose their rigid claws and develop hands for climbing trees. Through the ages in the trees, the prosimians evolved a sense of sight for judging distances and depths. Their eyes, now closer together, provided binocular vision, critical in moving from limb to limb. They are the beginning of the primate order, a kind of life set apart by a clutching, gripping hand. Millions of years the prosimians were spread throughout the forests of the world. Gradually their numbers diminished as a more advanced family emerged, the monkeys. In the monkey, nature achieved a masterpiece of adaptation, a creature whose senses, brain and body suited ideally for a life in the trees. Through the centuries, as he adjusted to his treetop life, his brain increased in complexity, and the monkey grew in intelligence. From different prosimian ancestors in different hemispheres, some 150 species evolved. The black and white colobus from the Blue Nile region of Ethiopia is a revelation of why a monkey's life depends upon its specialized vision and hands that clutch. The treetops are, for them, the only world. His mastery of the treetops evolved as his sole defense against the predators. In the trees, every primate species had its origins. Prosimians, monkeys, apes, and man. Only man has left the trees completely. Others, like the baboons, find safety here from dusk till dawn.
Then each morning they leave the trees in search of food. Not as individuals, but as a troop organized for mutual defense, they move out into open country. No baboon could survive alone on the open African grasslands. Individually weak, they have found safety in a strong, complex society. In part, the troop is welded together by a powerful common cause, the protection of the young. A baboon troop, like a human tribe, is a close-knit, enduring society that remains intact for generations. Within it, individuals grow up surrounded by security and affection. The most powerful males are the troop's defense, a warring battalion which will stand together and fight to the death. Three or four dominant older males have complete authority based on age, alliance, and aggressiveness. Status is won and held by a show of strength and courage. is some 40 members, each individual has his own definite rank and knows his place. <coughs> Existing side by side with other species, the baboon has become an integral part of savanna life, a vital link in its warning system. toward their natural refuge in the trees. It is the dominant males who retreat last and form the rear guard. To meet that one inevitable moment when a hunter stalks the plains, the baboons are bound together by common need. The lives of each depend upon the other. necessity, some species have had to form powerful societies. Only in this way could baboons and men have beaten the odds and survived. Japanese macaque field notes, Tuesday, 7 a.m. Bright and sunny. In a science which didn't exist 50 years ago, Dr. Gray Eaton, a psychologist, and his wife, Eileen, have found a new career. They are primatologists, dedicated to the study of non-human primates. See any new infants? No, I see a crooked arm is being groomed by a little owl over there. At the Oregon Primate Research Center, the Eatons spend every week of the year among a troop of macaques brought intact from their native Japan. Studies such as this, like the science of primatology itself, began with the realization that man has more in common with apes and monkeys than ever before suspected. 
That's Mrs. Perfect. It's threatening. She's the uh, animal at Arrowhead to speed up, and this is a good example of a high-ranking animal passing the buck down the list. That's a beautiful threat face. In this corral, monkeys are easily identified by markings, studied as individuals and as members of specific families and social groups. Even here, the Eatons have found strict social classes. Those born to low-ranking mothers are destined to live their lives on the lowest levels of this society. To Gray Eaton, this troop is a microcosm of human behavior, which is beginning to reveal why man is so aggressive, so concerned with sex, why he overeats, overdrinks, and overkills. Here, too, he also sees the beginnings of compassion, as animals defend others weaker than themselves. Of these monkeys, Gray Eaton has said, each one has a very distinctive personality. They have distinctive walks, distinctive faces. You get to know them, to understand them. It's not as though there are a bunch of little people out there. It's as though they're ambassadors from some foreign nation, the animal kingdom. On a barren, windswept peninsula, one tiny colony of Japanese macaques is living testimony to the primate's adaptability. Huddling against the six-month winter, the snow monkey of Japan exists further north than any other primate except man. Like living remnants of a vanished world, of a time when this island was lush and tropical, they are nomads, searching endlessly for food and shelter. By nature, they're equipped for eating plants and leaves, but when all else is gone, they draw sustenance from winter buds and tree bark and somehow cling to life. Swimming is a skill the wild monkeys of Koshima Island were unfamiliar with not long ago. Then in 1959, Japanese scientists, intrigued by the macaque's genius for adaptation, lured a few juveniles into the sea with peanuts. They became pioneers of a new pastime, which spread through most of the troop. As in other societies, it is often the young who revolutionize the culture. What began as a timid venture into the water in search of peanuts became in time a sport and a refuge from the midday heat. From birth, each Japanese macaque is raised in the traditions of its own troop. Elsewhere, they would learn different social behavior and natural aversion to the water. On Koshima, the young learn early to enjoy and use the sea. The monkeys of Koshima have learned to wash sand from food and reveal a glimmer of deductive reasoning. The wheat was introduced by man, the technique for cleaning it devised by a single monkey, a primitive inventor. By introducing to these wild monkeys new foods, such as sweet potatoes, scientists have been able to observe the development of new behavior. One young female, one and a half years old, originated the idea of washing sweet potatoes. Her habit was copied by playmates, then by mothers. Now it's part of the culture of Kushima. To carry their potatoes, they began to walk upright across the sand, a skill rarely practiced in other troops. Somewhere out of necessity, opportunity, or taste, this small group, like an independent nation, developed its own eating habits, social customs, and way of life. 
even after the potato is clean, they dip it in the sea. And scientists are convinced the monkeys are seasoning their food with salt. These monkeys are one more reminder that primate behavior is still changing, still evolving. The environment is a primary architect of any society, a molder of behavior. The chimpanzees of the West African rainforest live in the traditional carefree style of tree-dwelling apes. Miles beyond the rainforests, there are chimpanzees who live a different life in the open. Scientists from the University of Amsterdam have come to Guinea to study the savanna chimpanzee. To test the group's reaction to imminent danger, they rig a mechanical version of a natural enemy. Inquisitive and intelligent, the chimpanzee is the ape closest to man, perhaps not much inferior to our own primate ancestors who first left the trees. They hope to recreate something of the prehistoric past, to catch a glimpse of the way our ancestors first met the challenges of open ground. the scientists believe, may duplicate a scene enacted thousands of centuries ago, when early man first discovered the power and the promise of crude weapons. scientist who conceived this experiment, Dr. Adrian Cortland, is convinced that chimpanzees were once more advanced, more manlike. He believes that their great competitor, man himself, forced them back into the forest and back in time. Anthropologists believe that early man, physically defenseless against wild predators, survived because he learned the use of weapons. At first, nothing but a club. It's usually assumed that man alone knows that all living things must die. But these chimpanzees seem to have some understanding of death and search for its unmistakable signs. Perhaps this is how it happened once before with some unknown prehistoric primate, when some dim awakening intellect first knew the power of weapons, began to glory in the kill was stirred by combat. When did some brute creature first feel the thrill of conquest and carry from some forgotten battlefield a trophy from a fallen foe? That's a good boy. Come on. Come on. The rhesus monkey, biologically similar to man, is now accepted as a mirror of human psychology. Dr. Harry Harlow, a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin, has used baby monkeys for 20 years in his studies of human development. Five grams over yesterday. 
the animals. Dr. Harlow Sumfield has made the most significant contributions since Freud in revealing how later life is affected by childhood impressions. What are you having your lunch? Newborn rhesus monkeys will grow up not in accordance with nature, but in the controlled atmosphere of a laboratory where all the psychological influences of childhood can be duplicated. In a classic continuing study, infant monkeys are removed from the mother at birth and raised in semi-isolation. Other individuals can be seen and heard, but there is no physical contact, no interaction. Mother is a bit of plastic and shaggy cloth, a doll with no life of its own, but capable of nourishing the life of an infant. The monkey will come to depend upon this doll to satisfy basic necessities of life. Not only nourishment, but a deeper psychological need for comfort and security. In primate infants, there is an instinctive need to cling to another body, soft and warm. Food or security, which is motherhood's stronger appeal? Alongside a warm, familiar mother of cloth is a stark wire doll set up as nothing more than a feeding machine. The young monkey is placed deliberately on a cloth mother which has no milk to nourish him, but fulfills some fundamental needs. This experiment revolves around one simple question. Will the infant monkey switch his affection to a wire mother which offers food and life itself? Forced by hunger, does he loosen his grip and begin to yield to nature's most powerful internal drive? From the wire mother, he derives one thing, nourishment. No warmth, no comfort, no feeling of security. After feeding, he returns to spend up to 22 hours a day near the only mother he knows. From this inanimate object, the infant derives all the security and mother love he needs. He can, if also exposed early to other young, grow into a normal, well-adjusted adult. Some monkeys, like some people, are raised from birth in an affluent society, an enriched environment. Experimenters working under Dr. Harlow have created a monkey's utopia centering around a healthy, stable family. Sitting there, and the father seems to be ignoring the sister. I think 53 is also ignoring it. Wisconsin scientists are guided by Harry Harlow's theory that monkeys have a natural inclination for family life. For the young rhesus monkeys of this privileged group, this is suburbia in a laboratory. The infant monkeys are free to wander and visit other families, to play with all the neighbor's offspring in a central playground. Of all the monkeys raised in the Wisconsin laboratories for over two decades, those reared in the special environment are the most confident, the best adjusted. his what professional life, Harry Harlow has pursued the study of psychology in an animal laboratory, observing the effects of upbringing on basic attitudes and character. He believes that the dramas he witnesses are accurate reflections of human behavior. Confident and curious, 
young monkeys raised in an enriched environment make an immediate adjustment to their new surroundings. They are part of an experiment in child development. They are the control group. Raised in isolation, this monkey is, for the first time, in a strange environment. Never before has he been exposed socially to other monkeys. All are six months old and have received the same food and care. One has been deprived of any social contacts. From animals such as these, Harlow has learned that early relationships with other young are even more critical than a mother's love. An individual who forms no close attachments when very young will never be able to experience meaningful relationships as an adult. Discovering the cause of psychiatric trouble is the first step toward a cure. This monkey's problem is not his alone. It plagues humanity. An experiment in rehabilitation will begin with animals Harlow calls therapist monkeys. Younger and smaller, they will pose no threat and will in time begin to draw out the disturbed animal. In the Harlow laboratory, science is beginning to gauge the vital importance of infancy when behavior and personality are first formed. Monkeys dramatize the power of personal relationships on developing young. From birth, these young were raised together, a group of four. No mothers, no cloth substitutes, and no other animals. Referred to as together together monkeys, they have always found in clinging to each other the comfort of a mother, a security against an unknown world. Because of animals such as these, Harry Harlow is convinced that healthy social relationships in infancy and childhood are critical to the normal development of any primate, monkey, ape, or man. Man's closest relative has unexpectedly revealed a talent the human ego held was ours alone. His art is crude, but real, not a trick performed for some reward. His only motivation is to satisfy some inborn creative need, an urge for self-expression. In the paintings of chimpanzees, artists see aesthetic values, a sense of color, composition, balance, and design. Psychologists have mistaken them for the work of disturbed young children. The gift of artistic creativity is shared by man and the chimpanzee. But still we most often see him as an animal buffoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the Cincinnati Zoo. This afternoon, for your entertainment, Mr. Cecil Jackson will present our very special show. Today's show will consist of four chimpanzees. Angel, Eddie, most of us see the chimpanzee as an animal whose only purpose in life is to entertain us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cecil Jackson and Nettie doing some back skating now. A natural extrovert with the intelligence of a young child, he is the outstanding animal performer, among the easiest to train. He loves attention and glories in approval. We teach him and applaud him, and we see him not as what he is, but as what we made him. Only in the natural world of the chimpanzee can we fully comprehend his nature and intelligence. On the continent of Africa, in the nation of Tanzania, one small outpost of science is dedicated to the wild chimpanzee. And comes, then uh, avoids ever it charges up and uh, continues normal. At the Gombe Stream Research Center, 
A dozen scientists from around the world are delving into various aspects of chimpanzee life, from the raising of the young to their vocal language. This is the nerve center of a long-range intensive investigation reaching into the East African forest. Here, for more than 10 years, continuing records have been kept on individual chimpanzees. In 1960, there was nothing here but a group of wild chimpanzees and a forest wilderness. The first human being who reached out to them was a lone young scientist, Jane Goodall. Hello, Mike. For six months, they would not let her approach within 100 yards. Now she knows the entire group as individuals. Steve, come and have a look at Mike now. Because of Jane Goodall, scientists from many fields are drawn to Gombe Stream. Dr. David Hamburg is an MD from Stanford University, a psychiatrist who studies chimpanzees because of their close biological relationship to man. Yes. I must say he looks well. And they say he's put on quite a few pounds since he lost his dominance. Mm. I think that's maybe because he's always not so much more relaxed. The chimps of Gombe have earned a lasting niche in the scientific world. Through them, we have gained our most intimate and revealing look at natural primate behavior. A decade ago, it was generally believed that chimpanzees were vegetarians. In studying this group, Jane Goodall, backed by the National Geographic Society, discovered the truth about their eating behavior. Not only do they eat meat on occasion, but from time to time organize into hunting parties to capture small monkeys. Meat promises more than nourishment. It becomes the center of a primitive feast. For the chimpanzees, a very real social event. It is perhaps the one occasion when dominance fades. The hunter eats first, and the others share the spoils. For some unknown reason, the chimps usually chew leaves while they feast on meat. Perhaps it aids digestion or Maybe the chimp set the style in salad eating. For two years, Jane Goodall followed the chimpanzees alone. Then came a wildlife photographer, Baron Hugo Van Lawick, to capture her work on film. He was captivated by the British girl who lived among the apes. And in him, she found an understanding partner who shared her dedication to the animals. They married and have never relinquished the freedom of the forest where they have their work, each other, and the animals whose world they have become a part of. The unprecedented film studies of Hugo Van Lawick and Jane Goodall's patient, methodical approach combine to revolutionize our fundamental ideas of apes and man. So, Using twigs they have broken to length and stripped of leaves, the chimpanzees draw termites from a nest. Jane Goodall's discovery that the chimps not only use but manufacture tools significantly changed the scientific definition of man. He could no longer be classified as the only maker of tools. Their achievement is a simple one by human standards, but it elevates them far above all other animals, save one. Jane Goodall did not come to Gombe Stream to prove any preconceived ideas or theories. Her approach is still to watch and learn. One of her most dramatic discoveries occurred by accident. With bananas, chimpanzees were regularly drawn to the camp for filming and close-range observation. 
1967, Dr. Peter Marler of Rockefeller University was recording the sounds of the chimpanzee. Unexpectedly, they documented a startling drama of primitive emotions. The chimps had been, for the most part, good-natured and amiable. Now dissension and bickering erupted over the bananas. A tranquil society was transformed by sudden riches. The most dominant revealed an unsuspected selfish streak. The weaker had to beg. All the gestures of dominance and submission emerged. As long as the bananas lasted, there was tension and frustration among the once easy-going community. Living in their natural state, there is usually no reason for selfishness, no need to beg or fight for food. The vegetation in the forest is almost unlimited and belongs to all. This outburst, it was realized, had its origins long before this day. Large numbers of chimpanzees had begun to congregate around the feeding station. With congestion came tension and competition. A wealth of bananas had triggered outright aggression. The problem was solved by eliminating this kind of feeding, and the chimpanzees resumed their normal ways. <laughs> All around him, the leaves are changing color and falling. Look, Aunt Flo. That's funny, isn't it? Uh, Aunt Flo. In the raising of her own son, Grub, Jane Goodall has applied some of the natural methods of child rearing learned from the chimpanzees. As an infant, he was constantly handled and carried and played with. Never in a playpen, never alone. Her belief that we have much to learn from the chimpanzee is for Jane Goodall a personal act of faith. All before the blossom can come again in the spring, he tells her. Goodness, look, there's a cherry landing on her head. <laughs> See? Isn't that funny? This is word. Three generations of chimpanzees are now part of Jane Goodall's life. It took years to do what no one else had done, win their trust and confidence. From her understanding of these animals has come unexpected insight, an increased appreciation of mankind. These chimpanzees are a source of growing wonder, a reminder of how far humanity has really come in the evolution of man's intellect and language, his ability to love unselfishly, to appreciate and create beauty. Perhaps the narrowing chasm between man and apes will not be spanned by science alone, but by understanding and compassion. Hello, Flo. Hello, Flo.
In the eight centuries of its existence, the peaceful university town of Oxford, England, has weathered countless academic storms. It has become a time-worn battleground of intellectual revolution. Oxford is now the home of one zoology professor who published not long ago a book about mankind which disturbed the world. His name is Desmond Morris, author of the controversial bestseller, The Naked Ape. One of the things that surprised me when I called man a naked ape, which I did deliberately in order to make people think about human beings as animals, was the extent to which people were shocked by this idea. To me, as a zoologist, it was so obvious that man is an animal that uh, I was surprised to find myself fighting a rearguard action for Darwin a century after he wrote The Origin of Species. Desmond Morris's laboratory is the world, offices and pubs, the city streets. Here he gleaned the material for a later book, The Human Zoo, designed to awaken man from his complacency. His writings reveal not cynicism, but concern. His deepest feelings are not for man as ape, but for man as man. The future of the human primate, I suppose, lies in his ability to regain some kind of animal humility. Um, this doesn't mean that he has to lose his vision. Uh, this means simply that he has to accept his limitations and recognize that the Earth is a, a very small place and that with 3,000 million naked apes uh, running around on it at the moment, uh, we're already overcrowded uh, to an astonishing degree for the kind of animal that we are. In uh, a mere few thousand years, we have changed from being simple tribal hunters into being the urban masters of the world. We've got to stop imagining that somehow we are specially protected. We can become extinct just as easily as any other species. The only thing that will protect us will be if we sit down and very carefully ask ourselves, how far can we push man before we push him too far?